Hello, Anime Advisor here, your Anime Advisor helping you figure out what anime you want to watch. It's a little later than I originally planned, but it's finally time for the Summer 2016 Anime Review, where I take a look at 10 anime, along with a couple of shorts, from the Summer 2016 season, five of which I previewed at the start of the season. This video might run a little long, so let's go ahead and get started. Because I'm a bit of a masochist apparently, I like to cover not just good anime from the season, but bad anime as well. And while there has definitely been worse anime that I've covered, Taboo Tattoo is far from good. Fun fact, I nearly previewed Taboo Tattoo back in the summer preview, but thought Quality of Code looked a little more interesting, so I went with it instead. We'll see how that turned out a little later in the video. So what's up with Taboo Tattoo, and why do I think it's bad? Well, let's start with the premise and work our way to the problem. Taboo Tattoo follows Seigi, a middle schooler and martial artist. After defending a homeless man from some punks, Seigi is given a strange tattoo on the palm of his hand. It turns out that the tattoo is a secret weapon produced in the arms race between America and the Serenistan Kingdom. He soon meets US Army 1st Lieutenant Bluesy Floozy. Yes, apparently that is her real name. But most everyone calls her Izzy, and she teaches Seigi how to use the power of the tattoo. Kind of a weird premise, but this is anime so anything goes really. Where Taboo Tattoo struggles is the tone it wants to set. Is it trying to be gritty and realistic? Silly and campy? Or is it trying to have gratuitous fan service? Well, it's trying to be all three and that's the problem. People get gruesomely hurt or murdered in one scene only in the next to have a goofy gag or some fan service. Maybe even worse when it has extended gruesome scenes followed up by extended goofy scenes or fan service scenes. Essentially it tries too much to be all three and the result is a very confusing tone. The tone is one thing but the pacing might be even worse. Somewhere in Taboo Tattoo I think there's a halfway decent story but it's really hard to find especially towards the end because of how fast it goes. Like after the big battle in the middle of the season, where it just randomly cuts to Segi, who had apparently been missing for a few months. The scene plays out like it's a big deal, but it's hard to feel invested when they never show any of the characters looking for him. So why would the audience know or even care that he was missing? But don't worry, not only does it have another random and even bigger time skip, it also continues to not give the audience information. Like right before the final battle, where Segi jumps out of a helicopter to catch a falling up Izzy? She's clearly in the air at least, but the last time we saw her she was in an underground cave. And it's never shown how she actually got into the air. It did actually give us information on one character though, BB. Is he's friend and lover? Maybe? It never clearly defines it, just kind of implies it. Anyway, Taboo Tattoo does a decent job at filling in his backstory and a bit of his character. Though he was consumed by Segi's tattoo and now lives inside him like some type of ghost mentor thing? It's confusing and is explained as just a thing that can happen with tattoos. Taboo Tattoo continues its downward spiral with poor cinematography, which was heavily on display in the final battle, when Arya, the villain of the series, and Segi are fighting inside giant monsters. No, I don't know what's happening either. The scene is so hard to follow because it zooms in every time they hit each other, the camera is shaking about the entire time, it's cutting to other characters at the same time, and then also cutting to nothing. It's almost nauseating to watch. Taboo Tattoo, not great. And in fact, pretty bad. I'm just glad it's over, and I don't have to watch any more of it. Hey, what's this after the credit scene in the last episode? No. No, 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 no. I'm just going to move on to the next segment. I don't want to deal with the reality of a second season of Taboo Tattoo right now. The next couple of anime are anime that weren't exactly bad, however they also weren't very good either. The best term I can think of is that they are kind of okay, but still have some major flaws. It'll make a little more sense after I review them. So let's do that, starting with Ace Attorney. If you're familiar with the Ace Attorney video game, then you know that it follows Phoenix Wright and his assistant Maya, as he defends his clients in the court of law. With limited evidence and logic as his only weapon, can Phoenix turn the case around when all the odds are stacked against him? The answer is usually yes. That's kind of the point of the game and the reason all the cases have the word turnabout in it. So what happened? Why did Ace Attorney turn out only okay after I was so excited about the series originally back in the spring preview? That's your reminder that Ace Attorney is a leftover from the spring season. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that the animation isn't exactly stellar. It's really not good for a fair amount of the anime. It did seem to get a little better as the anime progressed, but it was short-lived. Just look at one of the final scenes of the series, where everyone is together for the last time. It's also the scene where Maya reunites with Phoenix, a big deal since she had been kidnapped the last few days, and this is the group shot? 
made worse because it just keeps cutting back to it over and over. As an adaptation, it's not the best. It skips some cases and completely skips anything to do with the Cyclops that the second game added, of which the second half of the series is based on. Also, it comes across as a little too quickly paced. The game is completely agonizing when you're trying to find the right piece of evidence or a flaw in the witness's testimony, and it can take a while to figure out. But for the most part in the anime, Phoenix seems to get it right away. That said, it did add some things that weren't too bad. In a complete episode dedicated to Phoenix and Edgeworth's past, which we only see snippets of in the games, and also added some fun running jokes like Phoenix hitting his head on the detention center glass. It also has quite a few fun little references and easter eggs that as someone who has played the video game, were nice to see. It wasn't the best adaptation of a video game, and it probably even wasn't the best adaptation of Ace Attorney, but the live action film adaptation it got a while back. The animation is far from good, but as a fan of the games, it was still nice to see some of my favorite scenes animated. Also, back in the spring preview, I was curious if Ace Attorney would receive an English dub. Well, it is getting an English dub, so I'm interested to see how they'll handle some things like burgers, as well as how they plan to handle turning Maya's five-syllable Narahodo kun to Nick when she's talking to Phoenix. Guess I'll just have to wait and see. Up next, and the first of the anime I previewed at the start of summer, Quality of Code. Several decades ago, children were evacuated to a code sleep facility during the invasion of the unknown. Awoken from their frozen slumber, they learn that their bodies develop supernatural abilities. These boys and girls now wage battles in defense against the unknown. Tis a bit of a silly name for an enemy, but there is an explanation for it in the series. Quality Code primarily follows six teenagers as they defend against the unknown. Asuha, Kasumi, Kanaria, Suzaku, Hotaru, and Mahime. I was a little worried going into Quality of Code that it might turn out to be a battle school harem, and I'm glad to say that's not even close to what's happening here. Well, they are battling, and there is a ranking system that you see in a lot of battle school anime. However, no specific school is ever depicted, and as for Harum, definitely not. It seemingly starts out with Suzaku as the central protagonist, which isn't great. He's kind of a prick for unspecified reasons, so the first few episodes are a little hard to watch. However, after a tragic event befalls him, the story starts opening up and becomes a lot more interesting, and even shifts focus to Mahime. Her personality, antics, and backstory alone almost make Quality of Code a must-watch. I want to be careful not to spoil too much of the story, because I did find it interesting, and how the events that happened affected the characters led to some great scenes. Like when Mahime and Hotaru visit Suzaku after the tragic event, and later in that episode when Mahime finally finds the time to grieve. There are some thrilling battles, fun characters, unexpected twists, some great character moments, sympathetic villains, good voice acting, and the insert songs during the battles are borderline amazing. I clearly seem to really enjoy Quality of Code, so why do I have it in the OK segment of the review? Well, considering that Quality of Code is an anime, it would have been nice for it to be actually animated. I'm being a tad facetious, but honestly the animation is not good. Characters going completely off model, reusing scenes, terribly drawn scenes, cutting away from action to show us nothing, leaving the audience to guess what's happening based on the sound effects. And that brings us to the scene I think of as the worst out of all of them. The scene is with Suzuku and Mahime in episode 4. Suzuku finally decides to not be as much of a prick and trust someone else to destroy the unknown, by throwing Mahime at the unknown and letting her do her thing. Suzuku is finally getting character development, Mahime is being a badass, the hard climactic battle is almost over, all that's left to do is watch the giant satisfying explosion. And yet what we get are a few stuttery frames, a freeze frame of the unknown that should be exploding, slowly just fading to white, and then a series of zooming out still images. Hell, I could have done that. I'll even make it pan to the right instead. It's completely maddening that this is what we got, and I know animation isn't easy, but the big climactic explosion should have taken priority in that episode. It's a series that does and has a lot of good things, but the animation is atrocious. Hopefully a lot of it gets fixed for the Blu-ray release, but it's a fix that shouldn't be necessary to begin with. Each season I like to cover a couple of short running time anime, since they have a higher chance of being overshadowed by their longer length counterparts. And as always with the short anime I review, I'll keep my review of them short as well. Up first from the shorts, The High School Life of a Fudanshi. I briefly teased this series back in the fall preview when I covered Kiss Him Not Me, where the main character there is a Fujoshi, a girl who's into boys love, also known as Yaoi. However, a guy who's into boys love is called a Fudanshi. Thus we have the title, The High School Life of a Fudanshi. 
Sakaguchi is a high school boy who loves boys love stories. And before you jump to any conclusions, he's straight. He hangs out with his friends Nakamura, the quote unquote normal one in the group, and fellow boys love enthusiast Nishihara. There's really not much to say, the animation isn't the best, but it is serviceable, and did give us some great reaction faces. Really, it has a simple joke, that he's a guy who likes boys love, and he likes to ship other guys he sees together. But the short run time prevents it from getting stale. It gets more fun when Ishihara joins the cast, and she starts shipping Sakaguchi with the guys she sees with him. In fact, not lost on Sakaguchi, he knows exactly what she's doing. Overall, The High School Life of a Fudanchi was a fun little comedy that took a peek at the yaoi fandom, and a little at convention culture as well. I think it's worth the time, especially since at 3 minute episodes each, you could knock the entire series out in a little over half an hour. And the other shirt I want to cover, Planetarian. While it technically has a longer runtime than most shorts I cover, 18 minutes compared to the usual 3 to 7, it also only had 5 episodes, so yeah, I'm gonna count it as a short. 30 years after the failure of the space colonization program, humanity is nearly extinct. A never-ending deadly rain falls on the Earth, as men known as Junkers plunder goods and artifacts from the ruins of civilization. One Junker sneaks into the most dangerous ruin, Sarcophagus City. While in the dead city, he discovers a pre-war planetarium, and is greeted by Yumeime Hoshino, a companion robot who works at the planetarium. She assumes he is the first customer she's had in 30 years and attempts to show him the stars but the planetarium projector is broken. Ultimately, after giving it some thought, he decides to stay and try to repair the projector. While planetarium doesn't present any new themes or ideas, we're all familiar with robots with feelings, dystopian futures are nothing new, and unsociable grumpy guys finding a companion are a dime a dozen. It does, however, execute those themes really well. Yumeime having feelings works here because while she is curious about the world and humans, she never wants to be considered anything but a robot. The dystopian future works well here because it's used as a setting and is only kind of part of the narrative. And Kuzuya, the Junker, works because of how well his character arc is handled, starting off not wanting to have anything to do with Yumeime, to gradually accepting her as a companion. There are a few other things that made me enjoy Planetarian, but that starts getting into spoiler territory with the story, and I'd like to avoid that here since, unlike Taboo Tattoo, I thought Planetarian was actually good. With the shorts out of the way, let's get back to covering the normal running time anime that aired this season. Starting with, this art club has a problem. It focuses on the art club of a certain middle school and its members. Subaru, a genius at drawing faces, but only wants to draw the perfect 2D waifu. Colette, a rich troublemaker who never stops making mischief. The club president, who uses the club room to get caught up on his sleep. And finally, Usami, the only person who actually wants to do art club-like activities, but also has a crush on Subaru. A completely one-sided affair since Subaru has no interest in 3D girls and is only interested in 2D ones. A sizable chunk of the anime is Usumi trying to get Subaru to notice her, and the misunderstandings and hijinks that ensue. It's cute and sincere all the effort she makes, but nothing ever works out the way she hopes it to. There's always a misunderstanding or someone or something getting in her way and the results are pretty entertaining. Just when you think Usumi's making progress, the rug's pulled out from under her and she's more or less back to where she started. It's something that may have been relatively boring had it not been for Subaru and Usumi's characters, as well as how much time the series focuses on the other characters. Colette almost steals the show anytime she's on screen. Her antics are fun to watch, and even if you're not watching her, she might be watching you. The fun only continues when Imari shows up, who has a lot of similar interests with Subaru. Of course, that's something that worries Usumi with hilarious results. And even the club's supervisor, Tachibana Sensei, gets in on the antics, willing or not. Another thing that was fun about this art club has a problem was all the little references to other anime or manga characters. Whether it be Subaru's drawings like of Kogane from Bubuki Baranki, by the way season 2 is currently airing, or whether it be at a bookstore. There were a ton of parody references in that bookstore, from Dagashikashi, The Devil is a Part-Timer, Gate, and what looks like plastic memories. That's only a handful of the ones I caught, and I'm sure there were some I missed. Now, some of the jokes were pretty easy to see coming. However, the anticipation of seeing the character's reaction was a joy. Being a rom-com, I know a few people will be upset that Subaru and Usami's relationship doesn't change all that much. But they're in middle school. This isn't VidCon. No one's going to be hooking up. Well, perhaps I spoke too soon. Anyway, this art clip has a problem was a fun comedy with even funner characters. It was a tad predictable, but still very much enjoyable. Back to an anime I covered in the summer preview, 91 Days. Taking place during Prohibition, the law holds no power, and the Mafia rules the town of Lawless. 
a town that thrives on the black market sales of illicitly brewed liquor. It's there where Angelo Lagusa returns under the name of Vilio Bruno to join the Mafia. However, he's not joining the Mafia to make some money. No, he's there for revenge. After receiving a letter from a mysterious sender informing him on who killed his family, Angelo sets his vengeance in motion against the Mafia. One of the biggest draws to 91 Days is its setting. It was a nice change of pace for an anime to be set during the dying days of Prohibition in the United States. I know other anime have been set at similar times and places, but anything that's not modern day Japan or fantasy world is a change of pace these days. 91 Days is very much a love letter slash homage to classic mafia and gangster films, with some of the cinematography and with some of the classic tropes seen in a variety of classic mafia films. I should also mention the opening and ending music and animation played a big part into setting the perfect tone for the series. However, what 91 Days does best is its story of revenge. Early on, after getting the letter, it's all Angelo cared about, going so far to drag his friend Corteo into it as well. Angelo was able to earn the trust of the Don's son, Nero, after a bonding road trip, and it's that bond that makes things interesting towards the end of 91 Days. It's not so much a story of revenge as it is how far is Angelo willing to go to carry out his revenge. They say revenge is a dish best served cold, but in this case, I think it may be much more appropriate to say that revenge is a dish best served with canned pineapple. It's all topped off with a very open and ambiguous ending, very fitting for a series paying homage to mafia slash gangster films. As much as I like 91 Days, it had some problems. The animation is relatively decent most of the time, but goes off model quite a bit at various times. As much as I enjoy 91 Days for paying tribute to Mafia and gangster films, it may do it a little too well with drawn out scenes of exposition that can be a little tedious to watch. Again, while tedious to watch in spots and the animation not being the best, 91 Days is a nice tribute to old Mafia and gangster films. And seeing how far Angelo was willing to go for the sake of revenge was fun to watch. Moving on to another anime I covered in the summer preview, Mob Psycho 100. It follows Shigeo Kageyama also known as Mob, an 8th grader with psychic abilities, but he withholds his power because of the negative attention he kept receiving. He goes around with his mentor Reagan, exercising spirits and attempting to realize his purpose in life. I wouldn't be surprised if there are quite a few people who decided to stay away from Mob Psycho 100 because of its art style. It has a humorously intentional simple art style based on the manga by One. Yes, the same guy who did One Punch Man. However, while the art style is simple, the animation itself and the cinematography, especially in the fight scenes, are glorious and amazing to watch, and honestly, might be some of the best of the season. There's also the beautiful paint on glass animation that we initially only saw during the ending animation, but gradually started working its way into the episodes as well. If you're wondering what paint on glass animation is, it's literally what it sounds like. Instead of colored pencil and paper, each frame is painted on a pane of glass. I'm sure it's a lot of hard work, but the results are stellar and give the anime yet another unique look. As much as I enjoyed the animation and cinematography, some of the characters might be even better. Mob tries to go through life relying on his powers as little as possible, despite how strong he is. His brother Ritsu has a great arc dealing with the fact that he's always been in Mob's shadow when it came to psychic abilities, and Hanazawa has some great character progression, as well as amazing hair. However, Reagan was easily the most fun to watch, as he conned and bluffed his way through all his situations. And for a con artist, he surprisingly made a pretty good role model for Mob, and even a few other characters. The story is decent enough, it's a coming of age story for Mob dealing with strong psychic abilities. Though it does sort of take a hard right turn all of a sudden towards the end when the evil psychic organization shows up, and all of a sudden that was a thing the characters had to deal with. While the fights during that arc were enjoyable, the pacing leading up to it was a little too fast. The story and pacing issues aside, Mob Psycho 100 was one of my favorites of the season. The art style may turn some people off, but everything else regarding the animation was very top notch, and the characters were great to watch. The rest of the anime that I'm covering all share a similar aspect. They all deal with reliving the past, and I can think of no better anime to start with, dealing with reliving the past, than Re-Life. If you recall, Re-Life is yet another anime I covered in the summer preview. It follows Arata Kaizaki, a down and out 27 year old who meets Ro Yoake who offers Kaizaki a strange pill, as part of an experiment, that will make him appear 17 so he can go back to high school and redo his life. Hence the name, Relife. There are a few rules he has to abide by, he can't do anything illegal for instance, but ultimately what he decides to do with his Relife is up to him. However, the experiment only lasts one year, so if he wants to get his life back on track, he only has so much time to figure it out. 
Real Life was interesting in more ways than one. Let's start with how it aired, at least here in the US on Crunchyroll. More or less right after the summer preview, Crunchyroll announced that it was going to air all of Real Life at once. I watched it over three to four days the week it came out, so all the way back in July. And while I missed reading and hearing people's weekly reaction, for a series that I think would have benefited from it, with all the silly moments and little twists it had, the plus side was it was much easier to avoid potential spoilers from the manga. But the most interesting thing was the characters, and how Real Life treats them. While it is primarily Kaizaki's story, Real Life doesn't shy away from giving other characters the spotlight. The story at times feels almost as much as Kaizaki's as it does Hishiro's, Karyu's, An's, Oga's, and Ro's. Now, a lot of it plays out as typical teenage melodrama, in regards to will they won't they, and why characters are upset with each other. But the fact that Kaizaki is an adult portraying a 17 year old is a unique twist to the school rom-com formula. That may get him in trouble in some situations, but him being there helps rationalize a lot of the problems the others are having, and gives him a very mentoring older brother feel to his character. As much as a teenage melodrama as it is sometimes, it also dives into the struggles of a working adult. Not just with Kaizaki, but Ro, and the teachers as well. Another thing that was done rather well here in real life was the music. And not just the ending music that changed every episode, but the piano background music that would occasionally appear in scenes, that added to the playful moments, as well as the angry and dramatic. As much as I did enjoy real life, it wasn't perfect. Again, I'll mention that it mostly plays out like a teenage melodrama. Also, while the animation is decent, it's not always the best. It also brings up that after the real life experiment ends, all of Kaizaki's classmates and teachers will have their memories of him erased, and attempts to play the sympathy card that once the experiment is over, all the friends and connections Kaizaki made will be forgotten. And I know they have a pill that can make you look 17, but memory erasing seems a bit outlandish to me. Considering all the logistics, not just with the people, but of any photos or videos that may have been taken of the person they were supposed to forget, and while the ending was cheerful, there wasn't much payoff regarding the story. Though, the reason for that is the anime is only a partial adaptation of an ongoing manga, so I won't hold that too much against it. Overall, while not perfect, I did enjoy Real Life's music, and really enjoyed Real Life's characters. However, that's not so easy for me to say about a couple of characters in our next anime. I want to tread very carefully with what I have to say about this next anime. I for the most part like to be a tad jovial when I review anime. However, I want to remind everyone that depression and suicide are serious matters. From my limited understanding of the causes of the two, Orange does a decent job depicting it. However, I'm still going to criticize other things about Orange, and I'm still going to be playful with this review. But I don't want to misconstrue that depression and suicide are joking matters. Because they're not. Orange follows Naho Takamiya, who one day receives a letter from herself from 10 years in the future. The letter states that her future self has many regrets, and she wants to fix them by making sure Naho makes the right decisions, especially regarding the new transfer student Kakaru, because he is no longer with them in the future. Orange's story is okay, very much your typical school romance. However, the main characters know what the future holds. And it's sort of a race against the clock in getting things right and preventing Kakaru's suicide that happens at a particular time and date. You may be thinking that doesn't sound very typical at all, and you're right, it shouldn't be, but Naho is one of the densest characters I've seen in a while. She can't express her feelings properly, and she can't read the mood when she tries to express her feelings. And yes, I know she's a somewhat shy teenager, and yes, I know it's her first love, so there's a lot of confusing emotions, but she has a letter from the future. A letter that conveniently details her day-to-day -day life with what to do and say and what not to do and say regarding Kakaru. Yet she either quite frequently doesn't do what the letter says or does what the letter says not to do. It would have been just as effective to not even read the letter. Kakaru isn't much better either. He can't express his feelings properly and he too has problems reading the mood. Because they can't properly talk to each other most of the time, watching Kakaru and Naho on screen together is just annoying. However, the other characters, Suwa, Hagita, Takako, and Azusa are all a lot more palatable to watch. They're really the best part of the anime if you ask me, with their personalities and antics. But unfortunately they don't get nearly enough screen time in the past timeline. Which brings me to one of my main sticking points against the series, the time travel. Early on, Orange was kind of interesting because I didn't know what theory of time travel Orange was going to use. 
Would it be a fixed timeline and nothing would change? Would it be a dynamic timeline where any change in the past could have dire consequences in the future? Sue and Naho have a baby in the future. Would them sending letters in the past cause their child to no longer exist? No, no, nothing nearly as dramatic as that. Orange uses multiverse theory, of which there are no consequences for sending the letters back in time, because sending the letters back in time creates an alternative timeline to their own. Alright, well, not as dramatic, but at least the baby's safe. But how do they send the letters back in time? Some type of time machine? Nope, nope. Bermuda Triangle. Seriously. What. The. Fuck. The worst thing about it is the characters even bring up how even if it somehow did work, and they were able to send the letters back in time, there wouldn't be any guarantee that they would ever be delivered. They just have to hope and believe that it'll work. Well, I believe I'm about done with this anime, especially after the poorly animated ninth episode. There's a chance it'll get fixed in the Blu-ray release, but I'm not that interested in watching Orange again. I'm not even all that interested in the sequel movie that was announced. Orange isn't terrible. From my limited understanding, it handles depression and suicide very well. However, the time travel dynamic is completely asinine, and made almost completely useless because Naho barely adheres to the letter, resulting in the supporting cast being more interesting than her and Kakaru. It comes across as a standard school romance even with its time travel element, that I'd almost say it'd be better without it. I realized that it would just be following the first timeline, and you know, maybe it should have. We're finally to the penultimate anime that I'll be covering, which means it's time for my sleeper hit of the season, where I take a look at an anime that wasn't as popular as other series, but I personally think was pretty good. My sleeper hit for the fall 2016 anime season? Time Travel Girl. Not to be confused with the girl who leapt through time, Time Travel Girl follows Mari, a girl whose father mysteriously disappeared three years ago. She and her friend Waka plan to make a cake for the boy Waka likes. But that plan is postponed when Mari opens a mysterious book and is sent hurtling into the past. The first thing that really caught my attention, despite Time Travel Girl being an educational series, was that it does not mess around. Not even 10 minutes into the first episode, and a kid takes a baseball to the sternum and it nearly kills him. But thanks to the technology based on the experiments and inventions of scientists long gone, they're able to save his life. That's a theme that's present throughout the series, modern technology and how scientists from the past eventually led to its discovery. Another thing I found interesting was, compared to Orange, that uses multiverse theory as its theory of time travel, Time Travel Girl uses a fixed timeline, which means that going into the past is part of history, and nothing Mori does in the past will change the future, but is the reason why history is the way it is. So when she goes back in time and talks to by shonen, slave owning, borderline lollicon Ben Franklin, that slavery isn't right, he is later inspired to argue against slavery, something he did indeed do. While I would say that the story isn't too special, Mari travels through time learning about science, and occasionally Waka joins along. It does, however, eventually build up to quite the dramatic and climactic finale. Again, I'm reminded of how serious the anime gets, despite being an educational series with quick science bits at the end of each episode. Getting trapped in the past, evil businessman, and even Mari's own father isn't painted in the best of light. With weird learned lessons like when Waka learns that studying isn't important as long as you're really good at something, like soccer. All a little unusual for a quote-unquote educational series. I did enjoy the explanation on how Mari is able to communicate with people who speak a different language, and it was also fun to see the looks Mari would receive for her risque and vulgar appearance when she went back in time. I was also surprisingly impressed with the CG here in Time Travel Girl. While the traditional animation is all pretty standard, the CG might actually be some of the best of the season. And that background music is quite good. It's exciting and somewhat majestic. Who did the music for this series? Oh, it's Hatomi Kuroishi, who also did the music for Code Geass. That explains a lot. While I adored the series, there were a few shortcomings. Personally, I would have liked to see Mari and Waka time travel together more considering how much it was built up after Waka finds the other compass. Mari, especially early on, is kind of an idiot, but that does give her more room to grow over the series. It also has a lot of the typical timey-wimey paradox stuff that can at times be a little hard to follow. To sum up my feelings on Time Travel Girl, it far exceeded my expectations for an educational anime. It has some really good character moments and drama, and that ending, seeing everything come full circle, was the icing on the cake. And to the final anime of the summer 2016 anime review, and also a leftover from the spring 2016 season. It was easily the most popular anime from both seasons, ReZero, starting life in another world. When Subaru Natsuki walks out of a convenience store, he is suddenly transported to a fantasy world. It's a dream come true for Subaru, but that starts to change when he gets attacked by some thugs, and gets the snot beat out of him. He's saved by a mysterious beautiful girl. 
The two later team up to find the insignia that was stolen from her. After locating the insignia, they're both brutally murdered. In most cases, that would be the end. But Subaru's nightmare is just beginning, because every time he dies, his time is reset, and has to start all over again from his last checkpoint. Subaru's return by death was easily the thing that drew me into the series, and why I was able to enjoy the series early on before character development started to happen. It's a nice little twist to the fantasy world formula, made more impactful by how brutal and tragic some of Subaru's deaths are. Seriously, the guy dies in multiple horrific ways, and it's only natural that it begins to take its toll on him, especially when the best options at times is for him to just kill himself. It ultimately puts him on the path of self-aggrandizement as a hero, and eventually he completely self-destructs, hurting the very person he's been trying to save. It's after that when Subaru's character development becomes more interesting as he struggles to overcome and distance himself from being that type of person. But it's not all about Subaru. Amelia is as mysterious as she is beautiful, while Ram and Rem have a fairly tragic backstory. It was also kind of interesting that we met a set of twins at the same time, but one becomes much more involved with the story, and Subaru himself, than the other. So good on ReZero for not having twins stick together as one character, but have them as two different separate characters. There were some other interesting characters with fleshed out backstories like Wilhelm, and there was also a particular fun and absolute insane character. If I have any major problems with ReZero, it's that the characters seem rather accepting of Subaru and his return by death. Remember, time was reset to his last checkpoint, and he's the only one who has any memory of the previous timeline. So it's a little strange that the characters go along with the plans of a guy they just met. Now that does bite him in the butt occasionally, but it seems to only do it when it's convenient for the plot. There are also characters that seem to be a major part of the story, but all but disappear. Though ReZero is based on an ongoing light novel series, so they could easily come back in the story. Overall, I enjoyed ReZero. It had a refreshing twist on the Trapped in the Fantasy World format, as well as an interesting character arc for Subaru, and I hope we'll get to see future installments of the light novel adapted someday. But until then, at least we have Season 2 of Konosuba to look forward to. Thanks for watching the Summer 2016 Anime Review. What were some of your favorite anime from the Summer 2016 season? Let me know in the comments below! The fall season is just underway, so there's plenty of time to get caught up. If you need some help figuring out what to watch, you can check out my Fall 2016 Anime Preview, where I took a look at 5 anime that piqued my interest going into the season. Also down in the description, I've got links to the My Anime List page for all the anime I covered in this review. With all that said, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And remember, I'm your Anime Advisor, Anime Advisor, helping you figure out what anime you want to watch.